us. Jesus is God in the flesh who has come to save us from our sins. Do you know him? Do you believe in him? Do you pursue him? You keep looking to sex and alcohol and drugs and shopping and food to give you happiness. You keep looking for human affirmation through likes and laughing faces on social media for gladness of heart. You keep pushing down the stress and the anxiety and the depression by doing this and that instead of looking to the one who came to make your heart new, the one who came to bring an end to suffering and sorrow and death, the one who promises, if you come to me, I will give you rest, the one in whose hand are pleasures forevermore, the one who is the fullness of joy in and of himself. This is who he is. Look to Jesus. The rest of us, let's open our Bibles to the Gospel of John, verses 19 through 34. The Gospel of John, chapter, nine, uh, chapter 1, verse 19 through 34. If you're new to making FBC, we preach through books of the Bible, so each week you're going to know kind of where we're going to be at. We're working our way through the Gospel of John. We just started it, uh, so we're in verses 19 through 34 this week. John chapter 1, verse 19. And this is the witness of John. When the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? And he confessed and did not deny. And he confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, well, What then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you a prophet? And he answered, No. They said to him, who are you so that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? He said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. As Isaiah the prophet said, now they had been sent from the Pharisees and they asked him and said to him, why then are you baptizing if you are not the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is he on behalf of whom I said, after me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. And I did not recognize him, but in order that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. And John bore witness saying, I have beheld the spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. And I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in the water said to me, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Let's pray. Father, we we ask that our our minds and our hearts would be open to receive your word. And we ask that your word would produce the fruit of righteousness in us as we understand it so that we can obey it. We thank you for the testimony of John. We thank you for the testimony of the gospel of John. We thank you, Father, for what you have revealed about Jesus, that we may know him that we may know you. Father, I ask that you would give us teachable spirits this morning. Pray that you would grip us in the power of your spirit and cause us to understand. I pray that you would persuade and convince us today of Jesus. In his name we pray. 
Amen. Why is the stuff of the world so appealing? I mean, this is a question that I think we have to ask ourselves. Why do we sacrifice a deeper, ever-enriching relationship with God for the cheap thrills of sin? Why is it that we prefer sex and money and power, likes on social media, or control of our circumstances? Why do we prefer these things to knowing God? Why do we seek relief from anxiety and depression and anger and stress and fear with drugs and food and alcohol or pornography? Why do we go to these things instead of going to Jesus? Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus said, Come to me, and I will give you rest. But we don't go to him. David said, delight yourself in Yahweh and he will give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. We long for rest, for peace, because we are weary. We are worn down. We are exhausted. We are stressed. We are depressed. And we long for the misery to stop. We long for peace. We long for gladness. We long for love. We long for acceptance. We long for belonging and a sense of community. And yet we do not turn to Jesus for these things. These desires of our heart are unmet because we keep turning away from the only one who can meet them. We do not delight ourselves in the Lord. We turn to that which does not satisfy over and over again. As we spoke about a couple of weeks ago, we tip up the dry, empty, cracked, broken bowls of this world's promises. If you do this, if you have this, then you will be content, then you will be satisfied, then you will have happiness and gladness of heart. But over and over we are left wanting. Isaiah 55, 2 says, Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Why do you spend your life pursuing that which doesn't satisfy your longings? That's the question. Why? Well, ask it in another way. Why do you not get into the car with a 15-year-old driver? Why do you pretend to eat breakfast that your five-year-old made for you while you were still asleep on Saturday morning? Well, it's simple, isn't it? I mean, we are unconvinced. We are unpersuaded that this 15-year-old driver can get us safely from point A to point B. And because of a lack of confidence in their skill and awareness and ability, we say, no, move into the passenger seat. I'm driving this morning. It's just not a good day. (laughs) Or when that plate of what may be eggs or oatmeal or toast or some combination of the three is being held out to you by a sticky, smiling, jelly-smeared face. And as you take it from him, you remember that this particular child is not particularly adept at wiping his hiney, and he's not particularly got a good track record for washing his hands post-wiping of the hiney, and you are not convinced that this is going to be good for human consumption, right? Right? And so because of a lack of confidence, a lack of persuasion that something is safe or good or will satisfy, you don't partake. We don't go to Jesus because we are unconvinced that he will, pers- that he will satisfy. We don't go to Jesus for rest because we are unconvinced that he really can give us experiential relief from stress or depression or anxiety or fear. And so we keep turning turning 
to other things. The scripture says in Psalm 1611, in your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forever. In your presence, God, there is fullness of joy. In the presence of God is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forever. Why do we not go to God? It is because we are not convinced that pleasure is found in Him. Pleasure is found in sex. We're not convinced that joy and gladness of heart is found in abundant measure, overflowing measure in God. And so we go to food, or we go shopping, or we go to alcohol, or we go to entertainment to make ourselves feel better. But they don't work. They don't last. What is it that you're going to instead of Jesus? What has persuaded you that it is the epicenter of happiness and joy? What is it that you are, what's that carrot on the stick that you are continually reaching after to give you peace, to give you rest, to give you joy, to give you gladness? Jesus said, I give it. But we don't go to him because we're not persuaded. And so we keep eating. We keep scrolling. We keep drinking. We keep smoking pot. We keep looking at pornography. We keep doing these things to relieve stress or to feel better or to get some kind of happiness and it never works. Nothing satisfies. Nothing lasts. Why do we keep spending our money for that which is not satisfying? Because we're not convinced. Jesus is the treasure that your heart longs for. There's a parable he said in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid, and from joy over it, he, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a guy who finds an immensely valuable treasure in the field and convinced and persuaded of the value of that treasure, he goes and gladly, joyfully sells everything else he owns in order to get enough money to buy the field so that he can have the treasure. The treasure to him has convinced him it is of infinite much more value than anything else he has. So he willingly, gladly parts with everything else he has in order to lay hold of the treasure because he's convinced the treasure is more valuable. We are not parting with all this stuff in this world because we are not convinced that Jesus is the treasure. We're chasing this stuff because we think this stuff is the treasure. So we sacrifice our families and we sacrifice our health and we sacrifice our mental well-being on things that do not satisfy. Jesus is the treasure. In fact, in Ephesians 2, verse 5 through 7, it says, By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places. Now, why did God do this? Why did God save you? Why did God God make you alive even when you were dead in your trespasses and sins? Look at what he says. In order that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Why did God save you? in order to lavish his kindness upon you for the rest of eternity. His kindness and his love and his grace are immeasurable. They can't be measured. You you cannot wrap your mind around the bigness of God's grace and kindness that he is going to lavish upon you through all eternity. What your heart is longing for, God is promising in Jesus Christ. But we keep licking the broken bowl that doesn't satisfy. Because we're not convinced. That's why this passage, along with many other passages in this book, are written. is to convince and persuade you that Jesus is the treasure. 
This passage, I think, persuades us to treasure Jesus above all things by highlighting three facts about Jesus' identity from the testimony of John. So John, John testifies about Jesus. He declares some things about Jesus. And those facts that he makes known to us about Jesus should persuade us. They should convince us. They should overwhelmingly cause us to be like, I want Jesus. I don't want this stuff. I want him. So let's look at them together. Number one, what does John say about Jesus? He says in verse 19, this is the witness of John. So this this is what John's official testimony regarding Jesus is. He's declaring facts about his identity. And number one, Jesus is Yahweh, arriving to end the reign of sin and death, and so usher in the new creation of God. That's a lot packed in there, but I think that's what John is saying here. Jesus is God. He is the God of the Old Testament, and he has come to bring an end to the rule and reign of sin and death. He's come to destroy it, he's come to abolish it, and he's come to establish the kingdom that never ends, the kingdom of peace and justice and joy, the kingdom ruled over by the Prince of Peace, the kingdom in which all things are made new, where suffering is no more, where death is no more, where sorrow is no more, where all is gladness and fullness of joy. This is what Jesus has come to accomplish. This is who he is. How do we get to that point from this? Let's look at the text in verse 19. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem, they asked him, who are you? Clearly, John is some kind of eschatological figure. There hasn't been a prophet in 400 years. From Malachi to John, 400 years without a prophet, without someone saying, thus says the Lord. They had the scriptures, they had the priests, they had the Levites, they had the teachers of the law, but they didn't have that man who was sent from God who said, I've heard a word from the Lord, this is what God says. And then John came. And people are flocking to John. They're running to John. John's not standing in downtown Jerusalem preaching his message. He's out in the middle of nowhere. He's out on the other side of the Jordan River, on the eastern side of the Jordan River, in the wilderness. And people are crossing the Jordan in order to get to John, in order to hear the message of John, in order to be baptized by John. And the leaders are like, what is going on here? Is this the Messiah? Is this Elijah, who is to precede the Messiah? Is this, is the day of the Lord upon us? And so they asked John, who are you? And John emphatically declares, I'm not the Christ. That's not who I am. I am not the Messiah. I am not the anointed one sent from God to save us from our sins. That's not who I am. I'm not the son of man who's been given authority, dominion, and splendor to establish the kingdom of David. That's not who I am. Okay, well then, are you, are you Elijah? No, I am not. What they're referencing is Malachi. Look at Malachi. It's the last book of the Old Testament, right before Matthew. Look at what Malachi says. These are the last words of the Old Testament. These are the last words of prophecy before 400 years of silence, and then John arrives. For behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff, and the day is coming, will set them ablaze, this says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. And you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. And you will tread down the wicked, for they, will, they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day I am preparing, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, even the statutes and ordinances which I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. So what he's saying is there's a day coming a day of judgment and salvation, a day of judgment for those who are wicked and evil and unrepentant. They will be judged, and a day of salvation and gladness and righteousness and rejoicing for those who fear the name of the Lord. That's what's coming, the final day of the Lord. Now look at verse 55. Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before 
the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And he will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the land with a curse. So before the day of the Lord occurs, before this day of salvation and judgment occurs, the prophet Elijah is going to come and he's going to bring up a, a restoration of the people back to God. Now why Elijah? Elijah was one of the most well-known prophets in the Old Testament. And his mission was to turn the heart of Israel away from Baal back to the Lord. When it seemed like the whole nation had abandoned Yahweh, Elijah comes, and he is used by God to turn the nation back to the Lord, away from idolatry. And so he's, he's saying that before the coming of the Lord, a prophet is going to arise, a prophet, Elijah, who's going to turn the hearts of the people back to the Lord so that they don't face judgment when the Lord comes, but rather salvation. And John says, that's not who I am. And we know from later reading, after John dies, Jesus says John is the fulfillment of the Elijah prophecy. He came as one in the spirit of Elijah. He came as the Elijah figure who turned the heart of God's people back to God and away from their sins. This is who he is. This is what he's done. John says, that's not who I am. Why does John say that? I don't think John probably saw himself in that. He was very focused on who he was. They said, well, are you the the prophet? He's referring to Deuteronomy 18. When Moses said, God is going to raise up a prophet like me, I think that's referring to Jesus. And John says, no, that's not who I am either. And then these guys are exasperated. Well, then who in the world are you? I mean, we got to tell, some, we got to tell them something. We, we, draw, we, we walked all the way over here. Please, tell us something. What does John do? He quotes Isaiah. He quotes Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make straight the way of Yahweh, as Isaiah the prophet said. John is quoting from Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40 through chapter 66 is a distinct portion of Isaiah in which the focus becomes the restoration of God's people from exile, the the forgiveness of God's people's sin, the bringing of God's people back to God. It's there we are introduced to the servant of the Lord who takes the sin of his people on his own shoulders and dies as their substitute so that they might be justified in the sight of God. It is in this section of text where the servant of the Lord brings about a salvation that results in the new heaven and the new earth being created. All of this stuff is in Isaiah 40 through 66. There's so much there we don't have time to get into, but you should go home and read it. You should think through it, and you should be shocked and amazed and uh, and wonder at how much Jesus is dripping from Isaiah. But John is saying, this is who I am. The day of the Lord is about to unfold. In fact, it's unfolding right now because he's here, and you didn't even recognize him. One is standing among you whom you do not even know. God. That's what he's referring to. Do you remember back over in in, in verse 11? It says, he came to his own, talking about the light, the word, which is Jesus. He came to his own, I think talking about the Jewish people, and those who were his own did not receive him. They didn't accept him. They didn't welcome him. They didn't even recognize him. In Isaiah 53, the same phenomenon is prophesied, that they would despise him, they would not esteem him, they would not look upon him favorably. He was not someone that they would notice as the king of glory arriving on earth. But John says, no, no, this is who he is. I'm not even worthy to do the most menial slave task imaginable because this is Yahweh in the flesh. God has arrived. God is here, and that means that the new creation is dawning. That means that the forgiveness of sins is upon us. That means that we are being made righteous in the sight of God. That means that God is going to judge the wicked, and he's going to save the righteous. That means that everything is going to be made new. That means that suffering and death are nearly over. That's what this means. And that's exactly what Jesus begins to do. What does he do immediately upon beginning his ministry? 
He starts healing people. He starts raising the dead. He starts casting out demons. He starts making things new. Even creation obeys his commands. And the storms and the squalls are silenced into peace and tranquility. Why? Because the king of glory is making all things new. This is who Jesus is. He is God on earth beginning the last phase of human history. The kingdom of God is here. That's what John is saying. He's here. And you, you, you don't even recognize him. You, you, you don't even know it. How tragic that God is among us and we're not amazed. We're not stunned. We're not on our knees worshiping. Jesus is God who has come to make all things new. That's what he's saying, first of all. Second, look at what he says in verse 29. The next day after these guys leave, John is teaching his disciples and Jesus, who had been baptized prior to this, comes down, down from the river, walking towards the gathering of people listening to John preach. And Jesus, or John points, look, Look, there, that's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You see, what's interesting here is when John's, when that, when that group of Jewish leaders were there, they were asking John who you were, and then when he told them, the very next question they asked is, well, then why in the world are you baptizing? Now, we might think this is not that big of a deal, but for these, these people, baptism was a big deal. Why? Because Jewish people were not baptized because baptism was an initiation into the covenant people of God. Those who were not part of the people of God were then circumcised and then baptized, cleansed, and then they were part of the people of God. So to be baptized was to declare, I have not been a person, a part of God's family, but now I am part of God's family. And so then they're like, why in the world are you baptizing Jewish people? And, and, and the reality is, John is, is kind of pulling back the, the, the covering for just a, a glimpse here that Jesus is going to wide open it in John chapter 3. The people of God are not those who have a particular ethnic identity. The people of God are not those who are physically descended from Abraham. Being Jewish doesn't mean you are a member of the covenant community. It's never been that way. All the way back in Deuteronomy, it's those who have a circumcised heart who are the people of God. When you read the Old Testament, it's the remnant of God's people. There's a group of God's people who have faith. It's always been by faith. Never been by ethnic identity. And yet they had made it about ethnic identity. And Jesus and John are both declaring all people are guilty of sin. And all people are going to face the judgment of God unless they turn from those sins in repentance and cling to Jesus, the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. The lamb who carries the sin away from the people so that they do not die. The lamb who is substitutionarily sacrificed in their place that they may not die. This is what Jesus is doing. This is why he came. He's the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Turn, turn to Ezekiel. This is a text you should know very well. I've quoted it many times. But in Ezekiel 36, you need to see the connection here. In verse 22, therefore, this is the prophet is speaking to the people of Israel who are in exile. In, in, in the promising them, a day is coming in which the exile will be over, their sins will be forgiven, their hearts will be made new so that they will walk in God's ways. This is what Jesus fulfills. He says in, therefore, in verse 22, Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. 
Then the nations will know that I am Yahweh, declares the Lord Yahweh, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. Listen to what he says. Because I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you with all your filthiness from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. And you will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers. So you will be my people and I will be your God. God is saying, I'm going to cleanse you with water and I'm going to transform you with the spirit. There's a day coming of salvation, which those who thought they were the people of God recognize I'm not the people of God. I am a sinner guilty of sin, deserving of God's judgment, but God sent his lamb, his lamb who was slain to purchase people from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, to make them into a kingdom of priests for God. This is what Jesus is. This is who he is. And I think it's an allusion to Isaiah 53. In Isaiah 53, he talks about the suffering servant. Look at Isaiah 53. In verse 4, Surely our griefs he himself bore, our sorrows he carried, Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. By his scourging, we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. God has caused our sin to fall upon the shoulders of Jesus so that he dies as our representative in our place so that our sins are erased and wiped out so that we can then have relationship with God. Now look at verse seven. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter. He's the lamb of God, led to slaughter for your sin and mine. Do you understand that without God's forgiveness in Christ, without Without God putting your sin on Jesus, you and I would go to hell for all eternity. But the good news of Christ is that he is the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. And in the taking away of the sin of the world, he takes away the condemnation and the judgment of hell for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. So the question is, do you see how gloriously good Jesus is? He is the God who brings in the new heaven and the new earth. He launches it. He starts it. And he does so by becoming the lamb who takes the sin of the world upon himself and dies in order to reconcile all things to God the Father. That's who Jesus is. That's what Jesus is doing. How do we know that this Jesus is this person? I mean... How, how do we know that? Perhaps that was a question that was implied because John answers that question next in verse 32. And John bore witness saying, I have beheld the spirit descending as a dove out of heaven and he remained upon him. So John, when he baptized Jesus, he saw the Holy Spirit come down and remain upon Jesus. He saw it with his physical eyes. He saw the Spirit of God anointing the Son of God for the work of the ministry. In verse 33, he said, I didn't recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in the water said to me, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. So God who spoke to John and sent John to to declare that people need to repent and prepare themselves to meet the Lord, said, the one who saves, Yahweh in the flesh, the person that he is, the way you'll know him, is that the Spirit will visibly descend and remain on him. When you see that, you know he is my chosen one. He is my son. That's what he's saying. This is the one who baptizes in the Spirit. Again, I think this is a reference to Joel, chapter 2. 
Because he talks about, and we know from Acts 2 that this is fulfilled when Jesus ascends to heaven. He pours out the Spirit on all mankind so that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He's saying, Jesus, the one whom the Spirit comes and anoints, is the same one, Yahweh, who will pour out his Spirit in the day of the Lord. And John's testimony is this, verse 34, I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. God. Now, the, the phrase son of God, there's actually two different possible translations or, or not t- translations, statements there. Some of the ancient manuscripts have son of God and some of the ancient manuscripts have chosen of God, the chosen of God. Both concepts are in John's gospel and both concepts are true. He is the son of God. He is the chosen of God. How do we know which one he's talking about here? I think he's, I think the older manuscripts use the word or use the phrase "chosen of God," and I think it's more likely that a, that a later manuscript was changed to "Son of God" than for "Son of God" to be changed to "Chosen of God." The technical stuff. I think the point is, I think what John is saying here is that this is the chosen of God, and why I think that is: go to Isaiah forty-two. This is a passage Jacob read a minute ago. Listen to what he says. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him and he will bring forth justice to the nations. Skip down to verse six. I am Yahweh. I have called you in righteousness. I will also hold you by the hand and watch over you. I will appoint you as a covenant to the people as a light to the nations, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those who dwell in darkness from prison. I am Yahweh. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another nor my praise to graven images. My servant, who is Jesus, is the one who is anointed by the Spirit. I put my Spirit upon him and I will appoint him to be a covenant. He is the one who ushers in the new covenant And he is the light of the world. He's the light to the nations. He opens the blind eyes. He rescues us from the dungeons of sin and death. He says, I am Yahweh. That's who he is. And and, and throughout Isaiah, you have these texts. In Isaiah uh, uh, chapter 61, Jesus himself quotes it in Luke 7 and says, this is fulfilled in my hearing. The spirit of the Lord is upon me to proclaim liberty to the captives. You know what I'm talking about? In Isaiah chapter 11, the same thing is alluded to. The one on whom the spirit resides is the one who ushers in the new creation. So all of this is pointing to the same thing. What John is saying is this guy, this Jesus, this person is the long-awaited Messiah, the long-awaited servant of the Lord who gives his life up in substitution for sinners that he might save God's people and justify the many by his own death. This is the servant of the Lord who brings into existence the new creation in which sin and sorrow and suffering and death are vanquished forevermore. This is who he is. And John says, that's the guy. Look at Jesus and be saved. He says all of this to persuade his listeners and to persuade us. Jesus is God in the flesh who has come to save us from our sins. Do you know him? Do you believe in him? Do you pursue him? You keep looking to sex and alcohol and drugs and shopping, and food to give you happiness. You keep looking for human affirmation through likes and laughing faces on social media for gladness of heart. You keep pushing down the stress and the anxiety and the depression by doing this and that instead of looking to the one who came to make your heart new, the one who came to bring an end to suffering and sorrow and death, the one who promises, if you come to me, I will give you rest, the one in whose hand are pleasures forevermore, the one who is the fullness of joy in and of himself. This is who he is. Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Are you struggling with sorrow? Are you, are, you, are you struggling for satisfaction? Are you struggling for gladness of heart? Look to Jesus. If you left this building and you were in a car accident and you were injured, you wouldn't then make yourself feel better by going shopping. You wouldn't make yourself feel better by taking a hit on the vape and getting some 
marijuana into the system. You wouldn't make yourself feel better by looking at pornography. You wouldn't make yourself feel better. No, no, you wouldn't do those things. What would you do? You would go to the hospital, to the doctor who can fix what is broken and get to the real source of your suffering and sorrow and make it better. Stop going to the dry and broken bowls of this world and go to the physician of your soul, the one who's come to heal and make new. This is who he is. He's the one who makes all things new. He's the one who's restoring our souls right now from the inside out, conforming us into the glory of God. This is who he is. We must be persuaded that this is who he is. Because until we are, we will not go to him. We'll keep going to the world. That's why John says in the letter, do not love the world nor the things of the world. Because if you do, the love of the Father is not in you. It's a mutually exclusive thing here. You go to the one, you go to the thing that you are persuaded and convinced will give you life and give you gladness and give you rest and give you peace. Is it Jesus? And if it's not Jesus, why is it not Jesus? Why are you not persuaded? Cry out and be saved.